Hi, folks, whoever's with us. Um, I'm Nicole Aminad. I am one of the directors of special education. And I'll let my colleague Sarah introduce herself. Um, I'm Sarah Cannon. Um, Nicole and I split up the, the district. I've been um, with the district four and a half years. I support schools in Castle Rock and Parker, and I support predominantly also SSN programming and bridge transition services. Nicole supports all of our um, schools in Highlands Ranch, and then she supports affective needs programming. Um, so that's kind of how we've divvied up work. We'll talk to anybody, however, and we'll get you to the right people if it's not us. Um, we can't see you, so it'll be, it'll be very important if you have questions that we don't answer, that you put them in chat. And our assistant, Connie, is going to be helping us monitor that, and I'll monitor that as well. And I apologize and distract it as we're home um, this evening, since it's evening, my dog is right next to me. So um, if you see a golden retriever head pop up, I'm sorry, he's a little ill-behaved this evening. <laughs> Well, thank you folks for being here. Um, as you know, Sarah and I are doing these um, meetups for you uh, about every two weeks. Um, when the holiday season kicks in, it might be just a little less than that with school holidays and, and things. But um, we're glad that you're here. We've had a chance to meet folks um, across the district, different times, different locations, and um, we've just really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you for being here. And what we did is we kind of looked through the questions that y'all populated prior um, to tonight in your RSVP. And thank you for doing that. It helps us kind of um, get themes and, and sort of maybe speak to some common things that are going on or, or questions that folks have. Um, a huge theme that came through in your questions tonight was um, or were around transitions. So we had multiple questions asking, what is that process between um, my student in middle school and, and then moving to high school or my high school student potentially moving to college or to the workforce or to what we have for our transition program bridge. So I think we'll tackle that set of questions first. Um, and maybe I can speak Sarah to the kind of the K-12 piece. And because Sarah works with our SSN students, she's very um, attached and very um, aware of what's happening to students between 12th grade and potentially our bridge programs. So we do have matriculation processes between elementary and middle, middle and high school. Um, and you should, in the transition between grades or between levels, um, go to what we call a matriculation meeting. So it's a pretty simple process of your elementary school meeting with your middle school or your middle school team meeting with your high school team and um, talking through the IEP, what makes sense in the new setting, um, potentially what classes or which teachers or which case manager makes the most sense, um, kind of specific to the new um, receiving school, the middle school or the high school. Um, and that becomes really important, especially when you go into high school, um, making sure that you're choosing courses that make sense, um, have a schedule that makes sense for a student, that sort of thing. And those matriculation meetings typically begin early spring and run um, kind of through the end of the school year. And then if you choose to move to a different school, maybe open enroll or something like that, um, it would be probably really important for you to reach out to your new school that wasn't in that matriculation meeting and make sure that they're aware of the IEP and um, kind of talk through some of that, the same questions. So when we move from high school into either the workforce um, or college or bridge, the process is a little different. As y'all know, um, your student is entitled to services either until they're 21 in Colorado or until they graduate from high school. And so depending on the circumstance for your child, um, they can do lots of different things. Um, after high school, but when they turn 15, which is usually um, this conversation starts in ninth grade, we begin to ask some very um, important questions about that transition. And your student in high school will have um, opportunities to complete um, like vocational or career surveys, doing a lot of thinking about what would they like to do after high school? What do they envision um, for themselves? And it becomes a topic in the IEP conversation um, when students turn 15, but mostly it happens in ninth grade typically. Um, and those conversations start out pretty general. And then as they move from ninth to 10th to 11th to 12th grade, um, 
typically that that conversation narrows a bit. Um, they might describe career goals or educational goals after after high school, and those get enveloped into the IEP and course of study. Um, things like that get onboarded depending on what your student wants to do. Um, we have the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or School to Work Alliance program. Sarah can talk about those a little bit more. Um, but we onboard additional resources depending on what direction your student's going. Um, I'll let Sarah speak to those because they tend to be a little bit more attached to our transition program bridge. But somebody did ask a question about college credits. Um, in Douglas County, we have um, the AP course courses that can count towards college credit if you get a four or five on the AP test. Those are not restricted in any way. Um, and so students may enroll in those courses in AP classes, um, take those, and then um, most colleges will honor the, those credits. So for students looking to get some college credit, um, in high school, typically AP classes are, are a way that they do that. Um, and so uh, accommodations can be honored during the class, um, but the AP test is a little different. So if you're in that circumstance, work with your case manager um, around testing accommodation um, questions. So that's a quick run through. Um, Sarah, do you wanna speak a little bit more to what a lot of our kids do, which is move into our bridge transition program. Yes, yeah, so um, our bridge transition program, I'm hoping to have dates for the first one coming up um, yet tonight. I'm not 100%, I sent out a text. So we have um, our bridge transition program, which is um, located on five campuses. It's for students aged 18 to 21. They have to have had um, earned their college or finished their high school credits. And, and or very close to, like we can accommodate one or two or maybe three credits, but it's really students that have finished high school. They've had that social graduation experience at the high school and they go to Bridge. Um, and then Bridge is pretty individualized and, and focuses a lot on those transition skills, work skills, um, teaching community and leisure activities, teaching some independent living skills. And that really just varies on the student. We have five campuses for Bridge this year. Um, we have about 120 students, but Starting about junior year of um, your of your child's junior year, a bridge um, representative will come to the IEP meeting, and we have a um, a teacher for each high school will come to the IEP meeting. And the IEP team is the one that will really decide. And you're a part of that team, of course, as the parent. Um, if the student needs transition services, if the student really requires additional support um, for those post high school um, skills after graduation, and so those conversations traditionally start about your junior year. Um, sometimes a little bit later than that. They can start earlier. If you'd like Bridge to come to your um, child's IEP meeting earlier, you can certainly request that from your child's case manager. We also have Bridge um, information nights. They will be happening, I believe, this month. Um, that will be invited, all, all of our high school um, students will be invited to those, and then you can come. Um, those will be virtual and participate and learn a little bit more about our Bridge program. Um, Bridge is also a great way to start help, um, Hopefully before your child hits 18, you've reached out to developmental pathways and some adult service agencies to start that process, but Bridge can also help connect with that. So that's the Bridge process. Um, as Nicole said, when students are 15, they also may be eligible for SWAP, which is our School to Work, Work Alliance program. SWAP is our connection to um, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, and SWAP can help um, your student with job skills and then also securing employment and keeping employment. So that's another option for students. I do wanna put a plug in just because um, I just wanna remind everybody it is November 1st. Our first round of open enrollment open today. It is open until the 1st of December. It is not a you know race and y'all have to sign up today. It is open for the entire month. But if you're looking to change your child's school for next year, um, you can access that through the Douglas County website for open enrollment. Most students with disabilities have an opportunity to open enroll unless, you're, um, unless your child is in an affective needs center-based program. Um, and then if your child is an SSN program, um, open enrollment is subject to program availability and space in that program. And we'll walk through all of that um, next month before open enrollment closes. So I just wanted to put that plug in. If you have open enrolled in your, your child in middle school right now, they are already assigned to that high school they will automatically that that middle school feeds into. Open enrollment um, website, 
has a ton of information, will answer lots of questions. It was a great FAQ. I previewed it last night. But I did want to put that plug in there if you're worried about thinking about matriculation for next year. Open enrollment is now um, open and it will close on December 1st. That's a lot of information. Um, what else? If not, um, the bridge and kitchen nights tonight, I will put them in the chat. Otherwise, we will make sure we send those out to all of our parents um, as soon as we have them available. Nicole. Okay. Um, and Nate, I'm not sure if our listeners have access to the chat or not. Um, and maybe, you. okay, maybe if you do have follow up questions um, or we need to clarify something, maybe we weren't clear. Um, I'm hoping that y'all can use the chat and we'll try to keep an eye on it. Um, but that's a quick run through in terms of matriculation. Oh, you have access. Yay. Okay. So then if there are questions um, or things you'd like us to um, speak a little bit more to or whatever, use that chat function. We'll try really hard to kind of monitor it um, and do our best there. So that transition was a big topic of um, some of the questions you populated before. Um, another thing that kind of a couple of you hit on was um, around social emotional learning, mental health services, affective needs programs, um, those sorts of things. So I'll, I'll try to address those questions. And, and again, we're not here to talk about specific student cases. We're just trying to give more general information. So if you do have um, details about your particular child, um, we would encourage you to reach out to case manager, your, um, uh, your special education coordinator, one of us. Um, we just don't want to um, answer specific student questions because um, we want to protect the privacy of your child. So mental health services on an IEP. Somebody was sort of asking, where do those come from? What do they look like? Um, and in Colorado, either a social worker or a psychologist is the one who provides mental health services. Um, they're called our special service providers, um, speech pathologists, OTs, any of those sort of auxiliary services are considered special service providers. And they're licensed um, very specifically to be able to work with um, students with IEPs. Like everything else in an IEP, um, whether you your child has mental health services or not is based on need. You do not have to have an emotional disability to receive uh, mental health support. Um, let's just say you're kind of anxious, maybe. Um, your student gets really um, anxious, maybe at a particular subject um, or in particular situations. Um, those kinds of things are often um, addressed through the IP via mental health services. So don't think your student has to have these extraordinary behavior bursts or things like that to qualify for mental health support. In most schools, most of the time for those, um, that level of concern, kind of that mild, moderate social emotional support, most of the time um, that service is done in a group. Um, it might be a social skills group. It might talk a little bit about social problem solving or um, reading body language or how to manage um, yourself when you feel a little dysregulated. What are some tips and tricks to stay calm? Um, things like that. Those are usually done in small groups. Sometimes we have practitioners pair up, which is super fantastic. So we might have um, a social worker and a speech pathologist, for example, um, working together. Uh, the psychologist or social worker would be providing um, maybe tools to help a student re-regulate, but the speech pathologist could be providing um, practice with language or running um, scenarios around what you could say or, or words that you could use or how you would advocate using words, things like that. So not all the time, but sometimes those uh, specialties pair and it can be a very powerful combination for kids. So um, that is sort of a general look and mental health services. And just because you have mental services, mental health services on your child's IEP for a year or two, doesn't mean that they're gonna be there forever. Um, you know, we, again, because we reevaluate that every three years in detail and also annually, you're still asking the question, what does a child need? Um, those services can um, be added as needed or, or taken away. They will come with goals, um, just like any other um, work that you're doing academically or whatever. Um, and they will be reported out on, those goals will be reported out on. So 
that's kind of the mental health service on the IEP itself. And a couple of people had questions about the curriculums that are being used. Um, I can't speak to every single school's sort of school-wide approach to social emotional learning. Um, there are different kinds of things happening. Um, we've got high schools with no place for hate, for example, um, that might be a primary um, tool that they're using. What I can tell you is that in our affective needs programs, and so that's if your child um, has a social emotional or behavioral concern that requires additional support. We have 11 of those in our elementaries for middle school and for high school programs. Um, they are using a combination of things um, that are research-based. And so we have AIM curriculum, for example, um, that our mental health providers are using in combination with um, zones of regulation and some other tools. So those are a little bit more prescribed and a little bit more, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Like uh, they're more standard across the district. Um, but in terms of maybe what a first grade classroom is doing, um, in general ed, just sort of school-wide, it can really vary. So if you're curious about what kind of social emotional learning your particular school is doing, I would encourage you to start with your case manager or you know, reach out to the building and, and ask those questions. I know that a lot of schools are doing um, sensory rooms and embedding a lot more um, kind of breaks and, and the, the awareness of the needs of students um, in this area has increased for sure. Uh, so it, ask at your school, ask your case manager, um, because we have different tiers of intervention and there are kind of universal interventions around social emotional learning that most kids are getting. Um, you know, how to be a good friend, for example, or how to solve a conflict, you know, things like that. Um, but as needs increase, then of course, the, the more targeted things come on um, and that would be you know, what we're talking about, we're talking about IEP services or um, at the at the most um, uh, top tier intervention, we're talking about affective needs programs. So that I think kind of hits the global questions, I hope, around um, social, emotional or behavioral concerns. One question did come when we talk about that top tier intervention of affective needs programs, which are a placement. You, you don't just wander in and out of affective needs. You actually um, are placed via your IEP process because it's a more restrictive environment. Um, and even though those affective needs programs are based in schools, um, they do represent a change in LRE. So somebody asked kind of what the balance is between servicing those affective needs and um, learning. So how do we balance education and behavior. And that's a real trick typically in affective needs programs. And our affective needs programs are very small. Um, typically 10 is considered a full program. Um, and we try to keep our numbers within reason and maybe a little lower than that just because the needs are pretty intense. So we know that if students aren't regulated, um, if they're not calm, if they're not able to focus their attention, um, if they're overwhelmed by anxiety, those things interfere with learning. And if we don't have our selves, our bodies and our emotions regulated, our minds aren't gonna learn very much. And so it is a trick within affective needs uh, programs to help students regulate so that they can engage in learning. And we know that that regulation has to come first before any learning will happen. Um, and so the goal is to build lagging skills, to help students um, improve their ability to tolerate frustration or to attend to tasks or things like that. And as those skills grow, then we have more and more access to the classroom. So sometimes students can tolerate or be in the classroom um, for only a short amount of time. And, and then they return to an affective needs setting where it's small, it's quiet, there's a little more support, there's less sensory input, things like that. Um, and other times we have students who are functioning almost entirely um, in their gen ed classroom and come back to the affective needs program as sort of a home base. Maybe they start and end their day there, or maybe they know that that's kind of a place they can go if it is a harder day. So there's a real range 
around our affective needs um, students and how much or how little they're in their general ed classrooms. Um, typically, our affective needs students um, don't necessarily have a co-occurring learning disability or speech and language disability. So the expectation for the most part is that they're going to be um, accessing grade level materials and things like that. Um, not exclusively, but um, you know, as much as possible, we want to put a student in the least restrictive environment. Um, but we also know that they need to be able to demonstrate a certain amount of independence um, before that is possible. So I hope that's what the question was getting at. If it wasn't, um, please let me know. But it is a balance. Um, whoever wrote the question, you're absolutely right. We try not to have it lean one too far one way or the other. Too much focus on behavior means no, not as much learning. Um, but we also know that if we don't focus on behavior and learning, it can't happen either. So it is a delicate balance. Um, and if you have additional questions, let, let me know. I'm guessing that Sarah is managing the chat a little bit over there. Sarah, do we have anything else popping up there? Um, no, I was looking at questions. There was a question about counselors, um, the role of counselors in the IEP, and I was going to talk to that real briefly. Um, okay. Just some specific questions with parents that I'm reaching out with contact information so they can call Connie or email us. Um, but counselors in Douglas County School District are a universal tier of support that all students can access. In Colorado, um, Colorado special education law um, has been somewhat prescriptive in that um, providers that provide services that are indicated on a student's IEP must be considered special service providers, which is a different licensure. So school social workers and school psychologists are the only quote unquote mental health providers allowed under Colorado state special education law for IEP services. So for the most part, as a rule, that is um, what we follow. We try to follow, follow um, the, the law. Part of, part of that is that a counselor's training and Nicole and I are both um, current former school psychologists. I'm a recovering school psychologist. She's more current her practice than I am, but we're both school psychologists by training. And the training that we receive and the training that school social workers receive is very different than the counselors. Um, counselors receive a lot of training, um, maybe on the academic and curriculum components and also on um, the guidance part, high school um, credits, graduation, college, those pieces. Whereas um, school psychologists and school social workers have more extensive evaluation background. Um, school psychologists have data analysis background, program evaluation background, and also the intense counseling skills that are needed to be a school social worker or a school psychologist. So I know in my graduate program, I took a whole year just of counseling methodologies um, and those kinds of things and how to use those in the schools. So there is a different training, but we rely on all of the specialists, counselors, social workers, and psychologists to really per, per, um, present a multi-tiered level of support for all students. So all students have access to universal. I would rely on counselors to help with that universal classroom support, large group, character education um, throughout the school, and the um, social workers and psychologists for the more intense intensive needs, crisis needs, and then also IEP needs. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of questions, a few questions. We get questions um, every time. Um, uh, so if you've joined us before, sorry, we kind of feel like we repeat ourselves sometimes, but it's a different audience and that's great. We always get a lot of questions about dyslexia and how the, um, the district um, addresses that. And as some of you referenced, we did have a dyslexia presentation in September. If I recall, um, it seems like it was just yesterday and it's hard to believe it's already November 1st um, about dis um, programming for students with dyslexia in our district. Some students with dyslexia do not require an IEP or a Section 504 plan. They're general education students. All students are general education students first. Um, and then some students after um, will have an evaluation and maybe determine eligible for a 504 where they need some accommodations or an IEP where they need specialized instruction in the area of reading. Some things that districts doing for dyslexia, um, not just for dyslexia, but for literacy, as you know, Corey Wise, our superintendent, one of his large pillars or big rocks that he wants to improve in the district is literacy. That is the number one thing every director, every department was tasked with, you're going to improve literacy scores across the district. So to that end, one of the things the district is doing is really focusing this year on K-6 literacy general instruction that all students would get. Um, we're really focusing on that. We're piloting three programs right now in K-6, um, three, uh, and then hopefully January, February timeframe, school leaders will choose of those three programs, which one they're going to adopt for next year. 
So we may have some, um, so we'll have more robust um, universal literacy instruction next year. To that end, then the culinary supporting work really focused on the intervention piece of that. So if we choose this as a, as a reading curriculum, what's gonna be the intervention that we do with that? All of our three pilot programs do have interventions embedded in them that we're work supporting um, training our special education providers to implement. And then the other part that Nicole and I are really focused on is also what does literacy intervention look like at the secondary level? Right now, the majority of our middle schools and high schools, I think actually all nine middle schools and all nine high schools use Read 180 System 44, which is a systemic um, reading approach um, that is structured literacy. That is one of the interventions that's being used by the district. And so we're still in that exploratory phase of what are other interventions that the district could um, use for intervention. We have, um, we're also trying to dip our toe a little bit in what universal reading instruction looks like in um, secondary school, but we haven't gone there yet. But Nicole and I are supporting that work. We have a coordinator on our team who supports that work as well. Um, and so that's part of the, where we are. The other part of that is just in, increasing training across the district from our own leadership team. We spend a lot of time with our leadership team and what is literacy? What are the components of literacy? How do we assess literacy in this district? And then also helping um, developing some coursework for special educators about how to further assess literacy needs um, if iReady doesn't give you all the answers to the questions you have, for example. So that's kind of where we're embedding our work right now, but lots of effort across the district on literacy programming because it is one of our big rocks. So we're supporting that work by supporting the role, the adoption of curriculum, investigating future curriculum um, resources and interventions, and then also supporting and providing lots of professional development. All right. If you have other literacy related questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll try to circle back to them if, if needed. Um, there was a really good question um, that I think is, is points to why parents are so critical to our process. Um, the question went, and I won't get the words exactly right, but um, the question was about this. Um, is it up to the school only to determine if a child belongs in special programming? Um, and I'm hoping that I'm interpreting the question right with this answer. If not, fire away, let us know. Um, and the answer is no, it's not entirely up to the school because we have a multidisciplinary team, an IEP team that includes parents. Um, sometimes we you know, we rely on the parent to tell us what is going on with this kid. Um, what are you seeing at home? What's worked in the past? Especially if you're new to our system, um, maybe you're coming from out of state or maybe you're in the process of an initial evaluation. Um, we really work hard um, to solicit information and ideas from parents and that gets reflected in the IEP. There are specific sections um, where parent input is um, recorded and things like that. So it's not a case of any one entity making a final decision. Um, the law provides for parents to have a voice. Um, we also encourage students, especially as they get older and begin to have a better sense of their disability um, to participate in those processes as well and have input into what's working, what's not, things like that. So the part that this may um, feel a little different. So not in, in creating the IEP, that's a collaborative process and you're welcome to bring on board information from outside providers and things like that. Um, where it gets a little bit um, less, I guess, less flexible maybe is around um, maybe your student's schedule, let's say. Um, I'm imagining a high school student who needs a resource class. Um, where they're going to do some of that read um, 180 work, for example. And the resource class, there's one section with read 180 and it's sixth period, and you got to move the kids' schedule around so that they for sure have that class period for resource. Um, and so it gets a little less flexible in terms of maybe uh, the schedule by which that IEP is implemented because there's so many factors. Um, you know, there's a zillion factors in a high school um, around master schedule and things like that. And in an elementary school, um, you know, we don't have full-time 
language, speech language um, pathologist, for example. And so maybe your speech pathologist is only there um, two days a week or three days a week. And so schedules are, are built a little bit around things like that. Um, and it can be difficult. I think one of the challenges that we face is if we do pull students out for specialized instruction, sometimes they're missing core content or other classroom activities. Um, and that, that can be um, a little frustrating. I think our teams do the best they can to minimize um, that intrusion, um, but in some cases it's just unavoidable. And so you should be talking with your classroom teacher, your homeroom teacher, uh, whoever kind of your main point of contact is there, your, your case manager, and making sure that if there is instruction or work time or things like that, that your child missed because they were pulled out for some specialized instruction, um, make sure that you have a plan for how to, to get that learning um, for, your, for your students, however that's going to look. And that's a pretty individual thing. I can't um, you know, I can't solve that one without input from the team, but you can, you and your um, case manager can sit down and talk about the consequence of, of maybe your child coming out of a classroom um, for that kind of work. But know that we, we do try really hard to um, minimize the intrusion into general ed um, classroom time, um, but sometimes it's just unavoidable. So I'm looking at See if there's any follow-ups. Nope, doesn't look like for that. So I hope that I hope when um, I answer that question, I was getting kind of in the direction um, that that person was wanting. If I if I really missed the mark, or or maybe you want to speak individually, feel free to pick up the phone um, and call. So, Sarah, did you have anything else? Otherwise, I do have at least one other thing that was kind of. <laughs> things are happening that are really busy this time of year there's also a mask question that nicole and i will tackle um not that for last um is it's a progress monitoring season and so we asked um it is required that every time that you get a report card for your student be that elementary middle or high school you get progress reports and iep goals to accompany that um and so those are being prepared and going out for schools that do um quarterly grades so you should be seeing those um, very soon. If you don't get progress reports, please reach out to your team, ask for those, or reach out to your special education coordinator over your school, over your child's school um, to help with that. Progress reports are one glimpse into your child and how they're doing on those IEP goals specifically. A question by somebody who's not here tonight um, asked about what are unmet goals. And um, the purpose of the IEP is, you know, is to provide your student with a specialized instruction and accommodations that they can access the general education curriculum. And um, that includes goals. And so if goals are um, not being met, it could be that the goal was not the right goal. It wasn't specific enough to the child's skill deficit. And so we want to have IEP meetings to address that. And so if you have unmet goals that you may want to discuss that in an IEP meeting, talk about why that is unmet or you know what we need to do to tweak that IEP so that the goals are more specifically addressed to your child. Obviously, we want to set. We have to set goals that are yearly, so we want them to be ambitious, um, but we don't want them to be so ambitious that they completely make, miss the mark and it looks like your child's not making progress. Alternatively, we also don't want to have to have an IEP meeting every six weeks because the goals are too short and your child's blowing through goals. I'd love it if every student met their IEP goals every single quarter. That would be fantastic, but it'd be a lot of meetings for you to attend, and we don't want to do that. So um, just letting you know that progress reports are starting to go home in schools that do quarterly grading, which is not every school in Douglas County, but um, we also are very near um, second semester. We're only about seven weeks away from the end of first semester. And so progress reports will be going home in the next couple of months um, for your child. And those every single um, goal on their IEP is progress monitored. And so you should get those reports shortly. And Sarah, can you speak to a question that came up um, that's related? Is there a way to see what minutes were logged for each student would it be on the progress monitoring? That's a question from one of our parents. Um, service logs will not be on progress reports. That is a separate um, request. You can request that. You can either put in a formal records request, again, on our website. The second tab on the special education page is request records. You can request the records there, or you can request um, service logs from your child's IEP team or again, from the special education coordinator that supports your school. Um, service logs are, um, are a separate document, but they are available upon request. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, um, let me just looking at the time. Oh, we have lots of time. It's only there was a, um, there was, I'm surprised this wasn't more of a question tonight. Maybe you are tired of it and that's totally fine. We don't want to talk. We don't want to belabor the point, but there was one mask question. I'm not sure if the person that asked the question is on tonight, but I did want to um, throw out there um, that we've um, kind of been in various places with masks um, this school year specifically. Um, as you know, Douglas County has been in and out of different health departments, Tri-County, Douglas County Health Department. Bottom line where we stand today, November 1st, is that we will, um, that all students and staff have to wear masks um, unless you have a medical exemption from a medical provider. And there, are, um, pro there were provisions for that, what that medical exemption had to look like. Um, now for students and IEPs, we also want to be reasonable. We want students to be wearing masks, of course, but we also understand that if you're maybe in speech language, you're receiving speech language services, if you're a student who's hearing impaired, there are times where we may need to um, drop our mask or take off our mask while you're receiving services so that you can see our face if that's really important in the special education service delivery for your student. So we're trying to be reasonable as well. We're not, you know, we're not, um, all masks all the time. We do understand that different students have different needs. And some students may have, maybe we're working up on tolerance of wearing masks, but the universal expectation is that students are wearing masks and staff are wearing masks unless there's a medical exemption. Now that can all change. Um, we have a, just a temporary injunction from federal court. And so we have to go back to court next week. And we don't know, Nicole and I have no idea what that's gonna look like after, but we do appreciate everybody's um, care and concern um, and questions, we're happy to continue to, to answer those questions. You have to wear masks on school buses. That's just like if you're on a flight on a plane, you have to wear a mask. That's F, um, federal requirements right now. Um, so we know we've kind of been a little bit all over the board. Our students have been great. Um, they just roll with it. Um, it hasn't been as, as much of a concern with schools, but I did want to just address that because there have been concerns. There's other, um, you know, we know COVID numbers are high. We also know that um, vaccinations may be opening up for five to 11 year olds here very shortly. Um, we're still trying to practice as many mitigation measures as we can. Um, and so frequent hand washing, just good if, you're, if your child is sick and showing symptoms, whether they're COVID presumed positive or not, we're gonna presume that they're positive. They should stay home when they're sick. Our staff should stay home when they're sick. Our EA should stay home when they're sick. Um, all of those things. If your child has been exposed, please keep them home until they have a negative test. So we're trying to do those things to keep students and staff safe. There have been cases where students have gotten, have been um, exposed while they're at school. Doesn't mean they've become positive, but they've been exposed. That was true last year as well. Um, I missed pandemic um, last in, in director school. I know Nicole missed that day too in class. Um, none of us planned on, on um, educating students in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. And we really thought that it would look different today than it does, but we continue to, um, our staff continue to be amazing. Our kids continue to be extremely resilient. We're still addressing their mental health needs and um, we wish we could wrap them in bubble wrap. But right now we are wearing masks um, and more to come from that on, from the superintendent after court again on the 8th. And I would say, you know, we've been doing this for a while now um, and I think most of the conversations that need to have been had have been had with those school based teams. And like Sarah said, we understand every student situation is different, whether it's speech and language needs or sensory needs or, or things like that. Um, and our teachers also understand that. And so hopefully um, you've had that conversation with your teacher team um, and they have put in what we would consider reasonable um, measures to both protect your student and provide for the accommodations that um, they're entitled to in their IEP. So if you have specific questions about your student, please reach out to your case manager or your coordinator um, and we will make sure that we review the practices that are happening in the building. Um, but we've we've been doing this for so long, I think we've gotten 99.9% .9 of um, those circumstances worked out already. But if there's been a change or you, you have questions, please let us know. So one of the questions it looks like, what specifically are the evaluation and testing requirements every three years? That is, what are the names of these tests? Great question. <laughs> Sarah or me, who, who wants it? Well, 
I think when we have, I think that's referring to reevaluations in the IEP process that the law um, asks for a reevaluation every three years, unless all the parties agree that an evaluation is not warranted. Evaluations take many forms. They are to be as individualized as students are. And so we maintain a very robust um, library of assessments. I couldn't possibly, there's probably over 88 assessments in our library from cognitive measures, so IQ measures to social emotional measures, measures of executive functioning, measures of behavior, academics, um, language, communication, articulation, it really runs the gamut. We assess in every area of concern, so occupational therapy, physical therapy, adaptive PE. So we assess in all areas of concern as individuals. So some assessments, some evaluations are very formal and have a lot of um, very, um, a lot of formal standardized measures in them. And some may just be a review of records or maybe we may just, we have a couple of questions about how they're processing math information. Or, so we'll just pick and choose what we need. Um, kind of depends on, again, the age of the student and ultimately what are the areas of concern. Um, and so we couldn't possibly name tests because there's so many, I mean, there's thousands upon thousands of tests that school districts use. We have a lot in our library that, we, that providers can, can use, it just depends on what the evaluation questions are. Um, you evaluate for a couple of issues. You evaluate, or a couple of reasons. You evaluate to determine eligibility for special education and related services. And you evaluate to develop programming. And so hopefully our evaluations are robust enough to do both of those things. Um, sometimes area, um, information presents itself in a different way, or sometimes there's new information that comes up that we have to look at. And we also appreciate part of that evaluation also includes, like I said, review of records. That could include private evaluations. Um, a lot of our families bring in um, evaluations that they have had done from private providers, and we love that. It gives us another glimpse of um, data for your, for your child in a different environment sometimes, and that's really helpful as well. A lot of those evaluations include your input, student interviews, parent interviews, and then also sometimes checklists that we're asking multiple people to complete to gather as complete of a picture of your child as, as we can in the educational setting. And then sometimes some disabilities require us to look in, outside of the education center. Like emotional disability, for example, when a school setting and also another environment. So um, that process is, um, is, it should look very similar to your child's initial evaluation. But again, the evaluation questions change as students um, age Sometimes we have a really robust battery of data already um, from students, um, schooling that we can pull, pull from. So again, it's reevaluations are as individualized as there are students. So we probably have 64,000 different ways we could do this in our district. So I really cannot answer it much more specifically than that. And then um, we have some, to that point, the district has supported, we also have, you know, we have to buy assessments and they're, they can be quite expensive. And so we, we pick and choose what is the one modality that we're going to most commonly. So we might buy a lot of versions of, I'm just going to go gold standard the self, the CELF5. It's um, a communication battery that includes articulation measures, social pragmatics, receptive and expressive language, and voice issues. It's a very robust battery. So school districts will sometimes pick and choose. There may be multiple tests that do the same thing, but they're going to pick and choose which ones are going to buy the most of. And then we might buy a few copies of other ones. So yes, um, probably so the district did support the Woodcock Johnson 4 when that came out. Some districts supported the, um, the WACI, some supported the KTEA. Um, we support the Woodcock Johnson. I, I wasn't part of those decisions. And so when new tests come out, we do bring together a group of professionals to figure out which test the district's gonna, um, gonna purchase the most of. Again, and then we have lots of different, like maybe we have like five copies of something that, that providers can, can check out. Um, we have a list available and not publicly on our internal library website. I imagine we could share that with people if you wanted, but it's really important that providers have a say in when they're sending home a consent for evaluation, they're not gonna name the specific assessments they're gonna give because we don't wanna be locked in. What if we have to give something else? Or what if um, a evaluation question came up that we didn't know about? So we wanna dig a little deeper in a reading concern, for example. So we're gonna give you a consent in global areas, cognitive communication, academics, health, social, emotional, um, and motor skills and transition skills and travel training if needed. Um, but the providers are gonna dictate kind of what 
They're going to kind of tell what tests they want to give because they know data they want to, they need to get to be able to answer the referral questions. So you can have a say in that. I would like us to look at this test and we can and we'll talk with you about that. But the content of that um, prior written notice for consent for evaluation remains with the um, school based multidisciplinary team and what evaluations are going to give. There are some evaluations out there that we have that maybe a provider is not familiar with. And so we would need to provide training before they could give that assessment. Um, and so some of those are, are, are um, challenges that sometimes we see as well. And Sarah, I apologize if you already said this, but typically the largest swath of assessments is going to come when you do an initial evaluation for special education because we want a really good picture of the entire 360 of your child. We want to make sure that we don't overlook any possible interference or um, you know, barrier to learning. As your child grows, um, you will get that opportunity for reevaluation every three years. And sometimes, especially as kids get into high school or middle school where they have a pretty dense record of assessment, you may see a narrowing of formal assessments. And that's not because we care about your kid less as they grow up. It's just that we already pretty much know, for example, that your student doesn't have a motor concern. And so why would we continue to test in that area, pull them out of class, use time, um, use their time and things like that. So no, um, especially as your child um, moves up in the grade levels, we're pretty confident um, at that point about what's not an area of disability. Now, if something has changed, for example, we do have students who maybe have a traumatic brain injury or some other um, potentially altering um, occurrence. And then we would, would re kind of re revert back to a broader um, spectrum of assessments, but know that we don't wanna pull your child out of class any more than is necessary to answer the presenting questions. And so if you see that, um, consent for a reevaluation and it doesn't have all the boxes checked. So maybe there's no concerns in the area of speech and language. Historically, there's never been, there's nothing that's really different. You might not get speech and language assessment because it's not going to tell us anything new. It doesn't address any presenting questions. Um, and if you're not sure why a box is or isn't checked on that form, reach out to your team. But know that it's not neglect. Typically, it's just because we already have really consistent and really um, historically dense information around that particular area. And we don't see a need to assess because it's not going to provide anything new. It's just going to tell us what we already know, which is they're functioning really well in that area. So um, just, just a little side note that um, our providers are really thoughtful in which assessments they use. And if they're not testing, there's probably a really, really good reason. And that reason is there's probably not a concern and there hasn't been historically in that area. So. Um, I don't see anything new in the chat. We have about 10 minutes left and we can't see your hands if you have your hands up. So if you have a question, you need to put it in the chat. Or if you want to call it and um, if you want to be done, we can do that as well. But we've answered the general themes. If you have a specific question about your student or your student's team, um, we'd ask that you connect with us directly. Again, Nicole supports schools um, that are in the Rock Canyon High School feeder, Highlands Ranch High School, Mountain Vista, Thunder um, Ridge, mm -hmm. um, as well as Plum Creek Academy. And I support the rest of them. There's a lot. Castleview High School, Douglas County High School. Chaparral, Legend, and Ponderosa, as well as Bridge. So again, anything in Cast Rock or Parker, um, reach out to me. Connie's phone number, um, we'll put in chat again, but it's 303-387-0080. That is our general line. You can get to Connie and she can schedule appointments with you um, if you wanna meet with one of us individually or if you wanna meet with both of us. Um, and she can also, um, if you also would like to access our boss said member, you can do that as well through Connie's office. Um, our next session, I know, let me look in, we have another parent engagement session at the Parker Library um, on November 19th from 1230 to 1.30, um, if you are interested in stopping by. Again, it'll be a fresh audience, different questions. Um, it'll be live in person, um, and so we can see hands and all that. So if you want to um, do that, again, we're trying to do this every couple of weeks. There's a new, there's something new in chat. Yeah, and I'll just add to the, since we're in kind of an announcement mode, um, 
most of these sessions we have um, reminded folks that you have an opportunity to join a parent advocacy group or a parent, um, I don't know, it's the DCCAC, it's um, Douglas County, um, sorry, I'm blanking, Sarah, Douglas help County me. Special, Douglas County Special Division 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 Advisory Division. Committee. Oh, there we go, too many really acronyms this late at night. Anyway, yeah. DCCAC has a link on our special education website. Um, they meet every month. It's a group of parents who have students on IEPs in our district, um, and they really partner with us. Their primary goal is to um, sort of keep their ear to the ground, listen and sort of um, interpret and, and then provide to us parent concerns um, to kind of collect information, stories, current state, um, and then bring it to Sarah and I um, for us to, to respond. And Sarah and I actually go to their meetings every other month. If you are interested, um, you can certainly look on our website. They have a link. They're also pretty active on social media, so you can follow them on Facebook and things like that. But DCCAC um, is a great option. They have multiple subcommittees too that are kind of maybe looking specifically at affective needs or, or other specific um, areas in, in that special education world. But the next DCCAC parent um, meeting is Wednesday. So this Wednesday, the third at 630 at Lone Tree Elementary School. It's usually about an hour and a half meeting or so. Um, you're welcome to just come and observe. Um, you know, you, this is not a, a for sure commitment. If you show up, we'll encourage you to come back, but you don't have to um, if you're just kind of curious about what we do. Um, and some of the amazing parents there, they, they really are advocates and we work closely with them. We value their input. It's just another avenue if you're looking for a way to kind of network or maybe connect with other parents who are facing similar situations, things like that. So DCCAC is a great opportunity just to get more deeply involved. If you would like to do that, we would invite you to do it. We would love to have more parent involvement. And DCCAC has a Facebook page on this year, and they have a website, and they also um, support three support groups. They support an affective needs um, parent mm -hmm. support group, an SSM parent support group, and a mild moderate support group, um, looking to rename that, but working on that anyway. And so those support groups um, are not advertised publicly because of the sometimes confidential nature that parents talk about with their students, but the Facebook page would have that information on there. And then once you reach out to the contact person, then you can get the link. Some of those are meeting virtually, some of those are meeting live. So that's another um, resource. They also have um, a website that is linked on our website um, that would also have that same information. So their support groups, I believe meet monthly, maybe every other month. So you could hang out with other, um, and the Facebook name is Douglas County Special Education Advisory Committee. Um, that's the name of the Facebook page. Um, and they're very helpful. In fact, um, the chair is on tonight, but in virtual format, you um, we're speaking on her behalf. Um, so other resources for you um, to um, just connect with other parents and find additional resources to help your students. Um, that, and then yeah. Jane has a, a question and I'm sorry, I'm looking not focused just because I'm trying to read it and it keeps moving around on me. Um, Jane says, um, I like this meeting. Thank you, Jane, we're glad you're here. Um, but would suggest that some hard or electronic copy of additional services would be excellent. General literature for families that is not on IEP and is sent often may be helpful in the gray areas. Um, do you actually have repository or website information? Um, that's kind of a large um, swath of, of stuff maybe that we can, we can talk about. Um, and yes, there's a ton of information on our website for sure, depending on exactly what you're looking for, Jane. Um, we also send a newsletter out monthly. And in that we um, highlight different programs in the district. We highlight um, you know, upcoming events or trainings or parent opportunities, things like that. Um, so you can look for that newsletter for information. Um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of um, service information you're looking for. But again, um, our website does talk about things like the School to Work Alliance program. Um, we don't have them because it's electronic tonight, but we brought some flyers from CDE that were um, 
intended to help parents ask some of those work transition questions. I think we had those at, at maybe a meeting or two ago. Um, so we, we do try to provide stuff, but Jane, if there are specific things that you think would be helpful for us to add as in the parent resource section of our website, um, we would love to hear from you what would be useful. Um, and we can definitely work on that. So thank you for that feedback. That's really good. Let's on see. that note, it's about 7.26, Nicole. So um, I so appreciate your time. I know that our numbers have kind of been dwindling as the evening's gone on. Um, great turnout tonight. Um, appreciate your time. Appreciate your, um, your questions. And again, if you have any questions that we didn't get to tonight or want to talk about your individual student, please let us know. Please connect with us. Um, and otherwise, um, Bray, you have to do this the day after Halloween. So um, we look forward to seeing you seeing you on the 19th. All right. So Carrie Ann, you're welcome. And the rest of you, thank you very much. I think that sounds like a sign off for tonight. Um, again, reach out, let us know how we can help you. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you, Connie, for being here.